Right. Okay, hi. Uh, can I just check to see you're able to see my screen and hear me fine? Yes, yep, we can see it. It looks good. All right, excellent. Uh, well, uh, it's great to uh, see you all again. Uh, I'm getting tired of these virtual meetings, to be honest with you, and I can't wait to actually meet people in person. Uh, but hopefully uh, I'm, I'm able to give you all a nice overview of uh, a different kind of composite material. I, I mean, this, this, the cost action is about composites for sensing. When you think of composites, you think of this nice three-dimensional dispersion of a filler in a matrix. But I'm going to talk about a composite sensor today that we've been working on for a few years now, um, which is a rather different kind of composite. And I'll, I'll tell you what that I, what I mean by that in a second. Um, let me just start off by introducing uh, the, the concept of a MEMS pressure sensor, because that's uh, the device we're talking about here. MEMS stands for microelectromechanical systems. And when you talk about things like graphene and, and smaller dimensions or in terms of the, the device thickness, you can talk about NEMS or nanoelectromechanical systems. These are very uh, good and, and developing fast for pressure sensor applications. And uh, by pressure sensors, I do include uh, things like microphones and even ultrasonics because effectively they are detecting sound pressure waves. And already MEMS microphones, for example, is something that many people would have encountered um, already in, in mobile devices and, and most, most compact microphones in, in mobile devices and laptops and stuff today are MEMS microphones. Uh, but also things like electronic uh, skin and implantable health monitoring, they're all increasingly uh, relying on MEMS pressure sensors. So broadly speaking, there are two categories of MEMS pressure sensors. Essentially, a MEMS pressure sensor, uh, in this case, a capacitive pressure sensor, works on the principle of having a parallel plate capacitor where one of the electrodes is movable under pressure. So when you apply the pressure, the electrode moves and you see a change in the capacitance which you read out. So it's a relatively simple principle. This actuating or moving membrane here uh, is typically made out of silicon uh, in microfabrication processes, or it can be a polymer film that is coated with metal. The advantages and disadvantages here with regards to the uh, silicon membrane, the silicon membrane is stiff, which means that it can operate over a larger pressure range, but because it's stiff, it uh, uh, essentially has a lower sensitivity. For a given pressure, the deflection is lower. The polymer membrane is softer, so for a given pressure, the deflection is larger, you get higher sensitivity, but it works only over a very small pressure range. So, uh, and, and also because of the membrane stiffness, silicon MEMS can be used for higher frequency application, whereas polymer MEMS, because it's a soft membrane, can be used only for low frequency applications. So this is where graphene comes into the picture. Graphene. Uh, is essentially what one would consider an ideal membrane for MEMS applications because it combines all the desirable properties. It combines thin, uh, uh, thinness, high stiffness, light weight, high electrical conductivity, all the sorts of things that one would look for in a MEMS membrane to give you the best performance. So theoretically speaking, graphene membranes should give you an excellent MEMS device, an excellent MEMS pressure sensor. And people have been trying to make graphene MEMS devices now for well over a decade. Sorry, the I forgot to turn off the automatic slide advance from this, it's annoying me. Um, the problem, however, has been that uh, fabricating graphene, suspended graphene structures has always been uh, difficult. So when you, you can see here that, for example, you get, uh, you get wrinkles when you do this kind of device, or if you try to overcome that, even by using few layer graphene, you still get wrinkles and you get trapped contaminants and things like that, which is not ideal for making a MEMS device. Yield is another problem. Uh, if you try and scale this up, or if you make an array of cavities and an array of capacitive drums, you get a huge number of points of failure with if you try to do this with graphene. So especially because you have to use 
CVD or chemical vapor deposition grown graphene, which is intrinsically very defective. And then you have to transfer it from the copper on which it is grown onto the silicon substrate that further introduces defects and contamination. So what, um, what we have developed in, in, in my group and we uh, started working. So when we started working on this problem a few years ago, uh, we initial trials we did were with pure graphene. And very quickly, we, we, we ran into all the same problems that other people have been uh, have run into before. So what ends up happening then is you, you need a way of, of getting these ultra thin stiff graphene membranes, but also 100% yield essentially across wafer scale. What we then developed is this composite. In this case, it's a laminated heterostructure composite where you have a graphene membrane or, or a graphene layer and the polymer layer essentially laminated together. So, uh, the, the polymer layer is very thin. It's a polymer called paroline, which is a CMOS compatible polymer. You can get, uh, typically we use about 50 nanometer thick layer of paroline coupled with uh, a nanometer or few nanometers of graphene. So that's the sort of capacitive membrane that, that we developed uh, and uh, studied the properties of this membrane and built some devices. So that's what I'll be talking about today. The device layout is relatively simple. We have an array of these cavities in the silicon silicon dioxide wafer. You put the soft graphene membrane on top. When you apply a pressure, the, the membrane goes into the cavity, the capacitance changes. This is now uh, multiplied by uh, the number of uh, individual capacitors you have in the array to give you the uh, overall sensitivity. So if you want a larger sensitivity, you just increase the number of cavities you have in the array for a given pressure range. And the dimensions of this of the cavity, the height and diameter of the cavity will determine the pressure range. So you can independently tune the pressure range and the sensitivity that you get in the given pressure range. So as you can see then, um, we, we are able to successfully fabricate large area, thousands of cavities with 100% yield. The membranes suspended on the cavities are relatively flat. You can see from AFM over a 20 micron cavity, the, the sagging of the membrane into the cavity is only of the order of 20 nanometers. So it's one in thousand, uh, practically negligible in this case. Um, and just sort of compare what you have here with what I showed you a couple of slides ago uh, in terms of the yield of what you know, one can get with uh, this graphene polymer composite membrane. So the first thing we did is something known as micro blister inflation to test the properties of the membrane. Essentially, what this is, is a balloon. So you have this cavity with, which is covered by the graphene membrane. You, you introduce this whole system into a high pressure chamber. The gas gradually diffuses to fill this cavity, diffuses through the oxide and through the interface to fill this cavity. And then when you take the, the sample out, then it, the, the, the membrane essentially inflates because of the high pressure that's formed inside. And you have to quickly measure the shape of this balloon or this bubble. And then there are equations that you can fit to the shape of this uh, bubble, uh, knowing the atmospheric pressure, knowing the internal pressure, you will be able to extract the, essentially the Young's modulus of the membrane, the two dimensional modulus of the membrane material. And then normalizing for the thickness of the membrane, you get the three dimensional, you get the Young's modulus of the membrane. So effectively, this is a way of doing your standard tensile test, but in a much more convoluted, complicated way, uh, because given the, the uh, size of the graphene that, that you can't actually uh, put it into any kind of vice grip to do this tensile testing. So um, we have essentially made a plot of the Young's modulus versus the, here in this case, the graphene volume fraction. So going back to, standard composite mechanics. And uh, surprisingly, despite having this laminated composite structure, we find that the relationship between the volume fraction, so the volume fraction effectively is given by the ratio of the thickness of the graphene to the thickness of the polymer, which are independently variable. Uh, we find that the Young's modulus we measure falls on this curve, which is known as the void upper bound fit, which is essentially the theoretical reinforcement that you can get 
for a given volume fraction of a filler in a matrix. So it, it actually follows a traditional bulk composite mechanics very well. And that allows us to then predict what the mechanical property will be for a, for a given combination of the graphene and the polymer layer thicknesses. We also then developed a couple of other advancements in this device fabrication in order to improve the, the performance of the final device. The first of which is essentially uh, what is known as a strain transfer technique. So uh, I've, I've spoke previously about things like wrinkles and stuff in the graphene membrane, and also this sagging that you observe. If you want to bring the, the to basically to get the highest sensitivity you can imagine, you need to bring your graphene and your back electrode as close to each other as possible. So your starting capacitance is already, uh, you know, it's very good. And then a small delta in that capacitance will be give you a large change in signal. But if you bring it too close, then things like electrostatics and even Casimir forces can pull the graphene down and stick it to the bottom of the cavity. So to prevent this, we actually apply a pretension to the membrane while we do the do the, the graphene deposition, which prevents uh, the graphene from sticking to the bottom of the membrane. And we also micro pattern the substrate inside the cavity in order to reduce the adhesion forces, which will, you know, which if, if, the, cav if the membrane bottoms out under pressure, when you release the pressure, it pops back up. So taking all of these uh, advancements together, we then, you know, we have a gas pressure test chamber with a control pressure valve and we cycle the pressure and, and tra trace the response with the graphene membrane versus your standard pressure gauge. Um, and from that, you can calculate the performance of the graphene sensor. So we measure the sensitivity at the, basically, so the properties we measure are the full pressure range of operation, the sensitivity uh, per millimeter square. So in sensitivity normalized for the chip size and the overall device sensitivity at the full pressure scale. So if you compare the graphene with the metal polymer sensor and the metal silicon sensor, essentially the take home message here is that the graphene sensor can give you very high sensitivity. So higher than either of these two. In fact, if you normalize for area, you get an order of magnitude higher sensitivity than anything that's been reported in literature for a capacitive MEMS pressure sensor. And you get a very large operational pressure range because the graphene membrane is a very strong membrane and you can actually deflect it quite a lot without damaging the membrane. So the, the sort of, a, so it, it's essentially, a, uh, a, it obviates this compromise or trade-off you have between um, having to choose between full pressure or pressure range and sensitivity. Um, and also you can, you can notice here uh, the differences in the device dimensions. Basically you have a thickness, overall thickness of the device to be an order of magnitude thinner than either the uh, standard metal or, or sorry, uh, polymer or silicon MEMS pressure sensors. So then we have done some work on, on scaling this up as well. We've not demonstrated yet on a wafer scale fabrication. We're working on that at the moment with a commercial MEMS fab. So we are trying to integrate what we've done here with standard MEMS processes. So fingers crossed that works. And then we can actually demonstrate wafer scale fabrication of these devices using standard MEMS processes. Um, we've also, uh, done something known as a touch mode or collapse mode sensors. So basically what is a collapse mode sensor? So a normal sensor, the, the suspended graphene membrane goes up and down in response to pressure. However, give, because of the geometry, the change in capacitance is non-linear, highly non-linear at higher pressures. Uh, and basically once this membrane comes very close to the cavity and touches the bottom of the cavity, you essentially enter into a different operation regime where it's essentially this annulus which forms your capacitor. It's no longer a parallel plate configuration. And because of the geometry, you can actually continue to run the pressure sensor in this regime, which is collapse mode or touch mode. And you actually get a quasi linear capacitance uh, change as a function of pressure and your sensitivity remains relatively constant across a very wide pressure range. 
So this is actually extremely desirable. So another, so we're actually working on two types of pressure sensors now. We've published separate papers on each. One is in collapse mode and one is in suspended mode. They are, they both have their benefits. So you can see here, as you increase the pressure, you can observe just optically the membrane collapsing and sort of laminating. And the beauty of this, the reason why you can do this with graphene and you cannot do this with polymer, you cannot do this with silicon. Silicon membranes will crack if you overpressure it so much. The polymer membrane, because it has a metal coating on it for conductivity, will have plastic deformation at high, uh, and even moderate pressures or, or, or strains. But the graphene can withstand an extremely large amount of strain and still elastically relax back to its original configuration. So this sort of a sensor can really only be done with a material like graphene. So again, we, we did this collapse mode pressure sensor. And in this case, okay, we said, let's try a sort of a real world pressure sensor application. In this case, uh, we, we uh, put this into a waterproof chamber. Um, and well, in this case, the graphene is actually exposed here, you can see, uh, and immersed it into a, into a tank uh, and followed the depth of the pressure sensor as a function of uh, the, which will give you the pressure, the water pressure. And again, um, comparing this to other sort of uh, state of the art, not just MEMS, but all different kinds of uh, pressure sensors for uh, un underwater pressure sensors. You can see again that the graphene polymer device that we have has excellent performance, both in terms of pressure range and sensitivity and repeatability and all of these metrics that, that we have. So basically both, both in uh, capacity, sorry, both, both in touch mode and suspended mode, these uh, composite membrane pressure sensors are actually working really, really well. So uh, again, I'm just going back to uh, this graph here where uh, uh, we, the, the idea now is to have one device, one type of device, the graphene pressure sensor, which can address all of these applications. At the moment, we've only been working at the low pressure regime uh, sorry, low frequency regime. So essentially DC pressure sensors, but we've now got projects running for both acoustic uh, pressure sensors, which is very complicated to design. Um, and, but actually surprisingly uh, ultrasonic, what are known as CMUTs or capacitive uh, micro machine ultrasound transducers. Those are actually easier to, 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 to design than acoustic frequencies. So we've got some work going on in the, in the design of uh, uh, my, of ultrasonic microphones as well for things like radio ultrasounds and stuff like that and then radar and sonar and all that sort of stuff, applications. Um, the, the next thing as well, I want to, the, another project we're running at the moment, we actually have now a, a spin out company as well, which is focusing on, on this area, is to apply the same principle to develop flexible, transparent pressure sensors for electronic skin type and human machine interface applications. So instead of using a silicon substrate, you can do exactly the same thing on a flexible substrate on plastic with graphene and, and uh, flexible dielectrics. So again, uh, for a range of different applications, uh, uh, the, the other thing that we can do as well is, again, this is just future, scoping, you can run this entire device in reverse instead of applying pressure and measuring a voltage, you can apply a signal and generate sound pressure waves or generate haptic feedback. So this is instead of a sensor, you have an actuator. We've not really done any work in this area, but uh, this is where the, this is the direction in which we're, we're headed with, uh, with this work. Ali, how much time do I have? A minute. Okay, I'm just gonna show you a quick video of, of what we're doing. Hopefully this will work. Uh, um, hold on a second. Uh, this was working a little while ago. Never mind. I just wanted to show you a video of the of the transparent, flexible touch pressure sensor, force touch sensor in action. But I, uh, I can't seem to get the video working um, for some reason. It was working when I trialed it. Uh, never mind. I don't have, have only a minute. So um, yeah, essentially, uh, just to summarize, we've been working on these uh, CVD graphene polymer heterostructure membranes for MEMS applications. We can do two types of pressure sensors, suspended and touch mode pressure sensors. Um, and we can also uh, do this on both rigid and transparent and flexible substrates. We've published 
three papers on, on this so far. There's a couple of patents uh, that we've been granted as well. And we also have a spin out company. So this is quite an active area. We're, the other thing I didn't talk about here, we're doing quite a lot of both uh, uh, coarse grain uh, MD simulations of this membrane behavior and also some finite element modeling of these membranes. So hopefully we'll have some papers coming out on that later on uh, in, in the coming, the next six to 12 months. Um, and also the scale up implementation in using standard MEMS architecture. So these are all the things to look out for in, in, the, in the next year, uh, you know, let's say over the course of this cost action. Hopefully I'll be able to present these advances in person in, in some of the upcoming meetings. Uh, 